when you had a head injury, you can have a major drop in um, testosterone in guys because the pituitary gland, which is dangling at the base of the brain, mm -hmm. gets a huge hit from the coup, counter coup, going back and forth with the small vessels there. Yeah. And that can drop your testosterone in half. And you look at a lot of these uh, professional football players, for example, many of them like Tony Corsett are years and years out and uh, they've got this uh, traumatic encephalopathy that's now occurring. So not only do they have the damage that probably could have been documented early on or five years later or whatnot, but they've had chronic inflammation as a result of the, the trauma there. They've not had the good blood flow to be able to repair some of the damage. And as a result, they've started to develop Alzheimer's like symptoms, dementia, and a downward spiral. We're taking a much more proactive approach rather than saying go home and take a nap for a week and come back to play. We're actually trying to do brain maps uh, to see where they're at in terms of whether or not there's some dysfunction related to the head injury. Um, I will do SPECT imaging on people that have had a pretty major injury and if they can get it covered by insurance or they're, they can pay out of pocket for it. The SPECT image is the image that looks at um, microvascular blood flow to the cortex of the brain and uses a radionucleotide tracer. Same thing we use when we look at the um, heart when we're doing a, a nuclear scan of the heart. Exact same technology, but we're looking at the brain. The SPECT will display areas, for example, if uh, somebody whacked you with a baseball bat to the left temporal region, you would see an area of decreased blood flow here. Um, we could document it via that microvascular blood flow impairment rather than just saying, hey, your MRI looks normal, which anatomically it may look absolutely fine, but we're not seeing the small vessel damage that's mm. present. So a lot of times, neurologists and ER docs are, are missing the, the more subtle damage to the brain because they're not doing a SPECT image. Um, another option is we can do PET imaging, which will show this as well. Um, so I'll, I'll do some advanced imaging. Um, I will look that over. I will look at their symptomology, obviously, and if they're far enough out, Typically we want to wait at least a month if not even longer before we consider this, but in a protocol that I'm doing with the Tug McGraw Foundation uh, and Seroscan Imaging, we're using near-infrared light therapy. So we have these little LED lights and a cap that we put over the head. The LEDs emit a wavelength which will go through the skull, mm. um, hit the small vessels in the brain, release some um, NOS, nitric oxide synthetase, cause a vasodilatation and help to um, reopen many of those capillaries that have been damaged or kind of spasmed. And we've been able to demonstrate this remarkably by repeating the SPECT image after about 18 sessions uh, with the light therapy for 20 minutes and have just seen, I mean, up to 100% improvement in terms of the, the blood flow. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Mike Mutzel with HighIntensityHealth.com. I'm so excited because we're live with Fred Grover today. This is episode number 70, and you're going to see actually a live interview in his office in Cherry Creek, Colorado, but we wanted to get him on here to do a quick little segment on chronic encephalopathy and talk about uh, football players and head trauma and all the interest now with Chris Borland, the 24-year-old rookie you know, defensive linebacker for the 49ers who has just retired after his first season. And so Fred's treated a lot of football players and helped them overcome some of the neurologic issues associated with that sport. So Fred, thanks for being here again. Thanks, Mike. Great to be on again. And uh, sunny day here in Denver. Looking, at, looking forward to going up to the mountains this weekend. Love it. Is there still snow? There is, so uh, I think it's going to be my last weekend of spring skiing and then uh, off to Costa Rica. There we go. Yeah. Right on. Cool. So what are your thoughts here with uh, this 24-year-old football player right at the start of his career retiring out of the blue and the health risks linked with that? Do you have any perspective or insight you want to share with us? You know, it's become an alarming finding that I've seen in my practice, and, and more and more young players are, are coming in. Most of them tend to be in their 30s and 40s, but I am seeing some younger ones, uh, such as Chris, uh, entering the office. And, and I think when you look at the kinetic forces that are involved and you know, playing a high exposure um, position like that as a linebacker or, or any other runner, uh, even alignment, of course, you're going to get some pretty major um, jostling of, of your brain. Uh, as we know, the cranium is a pretty solid structure. The brain is somewhat like jello, and when you get that coup, counter coup 
force injury, you're going to have shearing injury, you're going to have a lot of inflammation that is created, and down the road, people are going to start to uh, create uh, abnormal protein formation and then uh, develop and manifest some of the cognitive impairment that we see in the office. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that as players are becoming more knowledgeable of the pathophysiology, as UCLA and other institutions are starting to um, identify the early signs and symptoms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, we're going to uh, have more people realize that, hey, this is not worth it for my long-term health, and I'm getting the heck out of the NFL or whatever other sport uh, may be injuring them in such a way. I had a, uh, a NASCAR um, race car driver that I saw last week, actually, who had suffered a few concussions uh, in an early college football career, and then uh, a few more as a NASCAR driver, and a young guy in his 40s, uh, pretty severely impaired right now. So wow. it's um, definitely out there, and I'm seeing more of it. Yeah. So f let's just use that example. Uh, what do you recommend from a you know nutritional standpoint, and then like biofeedback and neurological feedback? Like, what sort of what's your protocol, or what's your workup f for this gentleman, and what sort of things is he doing to help to yeah. restore his brain function? Yeah, great question. So I, I start obviously with a, a good exam and, and history. Um, based upon the findings, I'll proceed with an MRI or a CT to look at the anatomical structures of the brain to make sure we don't have any abnormalities that are there that have been missed. Sometimes we'll find an old um, bleed that's been in the brain. Uh, most of the time, the anatomic imaging is totally normal, so then I'll go on to a functional brain imaging uh, test, which is either a um, SPECT image or a functional MRI. SPECT is the one that I most readily use because it gives me a little bit better picture of the microvascular blood flow, and we've got a great facility here in town uh, called Seroscan. Uh, the SPECT can then confirm uh, my suspicion of uh, an injury. Most commonly, I, I see it in the uh, temporal region of the brain, uh, but it can be in the frontotemporal as well. And when we see that area of reduced perfusion, um, We'll then uh, proceed with the treatment protocol, and in my case, instead of just being a simple, um, you know, rest and kind of let the tincture of time take care of it, um, I like to do a more global approach, which includes nutrition and uh, looking at anti-inflammatory uh, nutritional elements such as glutathione, omega-3s, coenzyme Q10, um, all those things that will support um, the microglia regeneration as well as the neuronal regeneration and neurotransmitter function. I will test for MTHFR, COMT, and any other detoxification pathways that may be impaired and contributing to the overall picture of uh, poor healing from this type of injury. Um, I will do a full lifestyle assessment and look for opportunities to improve their mindfulness, getting them away from their iPad and getting them into meditation, getting them off the couch and getting them into yoga or some other type of uh, meditative practice, even a walking meditation can be great. Mm -hmm. And then um, regular exercise, of course, to improve that cerebral uh, vascular blood flow is critical, uh, particularly the aerobic. Um, and then looking at other um, innovative strategies, and, and I discussed this a fair amount in our earlier interview, the use of transcranial near-infrared light therapy that we just finished our study, and today I'm actually working on writing up the results and uh, I hope to get that published in the next uh, month or two, but we showed a dramatic improvement uh, amongst veterans who had suffered TBI as far as five to ten years back on the injury with improved blood flow, improved um, cognition, reduction in depression, suicidality, etc. So I think this is going to be a great modality that can be used in our NFL players to help them recover. And we are using it in NFL players, too. We don't have a big research project going on as of yet, but we plan to hopefully get funding for that and get it rocking and rolling here pretty soon. So I think the whole key to uh, brain, uh, traumatic brain injury, et cetera, is if you can avoid it. <laughs> but if you're you know, passionate about playing football and, and you're in the NFL, you know, do the best you can to protect yourself within the, the league regulations and stay the heck out of the game uh, when you've had an injury for the recommended time. But then look for strategies that are going to be more proactive rather than the uh, fairly uh, basic procedure, which is just go home and rest for a week. There's a lot more we can do in terms of uh, brain injury resolution than 
uh, sitting in a dark room. And in mm -hmm. fact, we're finding that that strategy may cause a little bit of harm when we're completely in a solitary confinement mode. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So let's kind of plug neurofeedback and some of the linemen that you've worked with and, and one of the, the benefits there. And, you know, maybe for folks that are in college and they've had a little head injury or from high school sports. Some... Mm -hmm. So neurofeedback, yeah, it's another great strategy that we uh, deploy here in our office. Neurofeedback is a methodology where we're able to hook leads up onto the brain after we've done a, a QEEG brain map. So it's kind of the, uh, the fully wired cap that you've probably seen in the movies where people are getting all their brainwave analyzed. And uh, we're actually doing a study looking at some of the athletes up at uh, CU Boulder and, and head injuries up there where we've done imaging of their brain through the electrical brain mapping uh, prior to any concussion. And then after it's happened, we've looked to see what has changed. And then we will go in and we'll do the neurofeedback which will get them back to their baseline or even an improved state. Mm -hmm. uh, when we do neurofeedback, we uh, look for abnormalities that are on the initial brain map or the post-concussive brain map, and then we train the brain by putting these sensors on the, the forehead. There's no electricity going out. It's just simply reading the electrical activity um, through the forehead or wherever we place the leads, depending on where we feel the injury is. And we have them... Uh, watch a movie or they listen to music and when they're going into the, the right zone in terms of um, their brainwave activity for improved focus, uh, that music will play or the video will play. When they're not staying focused in the zone that we want them to, then um, it, it won't play. So the positive reinforcement is play, the, the negative is uh, taking it away. And what we'll do is we'll retrain the brain to reconnect in those areas and tracks that have been damaged and then we'll retrain the brain to have a healthier brainwave status. So neurofeedback, definitely an important modality to add in, in addition to the transcranial near-infrared light therapy, uh, in my opinion, and of course the nutrition, lifestyle, exercise. All those combined, I think, are gonna give, give us the um, balance and recovery that we need. That's fantastic. Now, can you use the neurofeedback as more of like a prophylactic type thing, like if you're have the occupation such or you're you know doing recreational sports where there's head injury potential would this be something you recommend once a month just to get a baseline of your neurological activity I think it's a great idea and, and I think at least getting uh, an initial brain map is a great idea to have on file uh, kind of like if you're making a backup of your computer you can get it on your external hard drive and then if things go down you can go to a baseline and say, I'm going to recover from, you know, this particular date. We're not going to be able to do that, obviously, to your brain, but we say, well, this is what it looked like back in December of 2012, uh, and, and here's where we are now, and then we can try to hopefully get back to baseline and, and improve that. I think that's a, a great thing to do. And then for folks that want to use neurofeedback, actually, to improve their game, we've had a few that are tennis players, professional tennis players actually have been in our office uh, using neurofeedback to improve their game and focus. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, leadership consultants that really have to be on their game when they're talking to, to big crowds and they want to be able to speak very coherently and quickly and uh, we've helped them with focus and being able to maintain a little faster brainwave state. So it could be great there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's benefited me. I haven't had the treatment in a little while, but when I lived there I used it, so it's a yeah. fantastic therapy. Yeah, it's very cool. And there's some home devices now that are out. Uh, there's one called the Muse that we're using, M-U-S-E, that uh, has been shown to help a lot of our patients as well. It's not quite as powerful and um, pinpoint as is what we're doing with our device, but it's a nice one for people to be aware of and a few other devices similar to that. that you can use. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Dr. Grover, thank you so much. And then we're now going to flip it to the interview in your office. So thanks for tuning in. We're live with Dr. Fred Grover of Revolutionary MD, and we're going to talk all about the brain today. So Dr. Grover, how you doing? Doing great, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, glad to be here, Mike. Appreciate you putting me on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> so before we talk about the brain, I would love to hear your medical journey because you've trained a lot of you know, physicians, you're board certified in not only family medicine, but also anti-aging medicine. So talk about your journey a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, did a residency out here in Colorado and uh, enjoyed that thoroughly in family medicine. Um, after finishing that, uh, traveled around the world and uh, did some meditation with monks in Nepal, did some travel to uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, came back and then was working at Kaiser uh, for a few years and then decided to 
go on my journey to teach um, residents and medical students, mainly residents at uh, the University of Colorado. Realized that I really needed to diversify what I was doing and expand it out by getting additional board certifications in anti-aging medicine as well as integrative holistic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that to really provide good medical care that uh, I needed to have that extra expertise and um, expand out from my base of primary care, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. I think family medicine offers a, a great foundation, but being able to add on more expertise in terms of hormone balancing, more expertise in terms of the functional medicine and the integrative medicine to help people in the nutritional balancing as well as uh, lifestyle and mindfulness that you're able to achieve much yeah. more. Um, the big problem I found with medicine was that uh, we were introduced to a model that is mainly sick care medicine rather than preventative and wellness. The whole reason I went into primary care uh, was to do more prevention and wellness, but I found myself just dealing with poorly controlled diabetics, uh, poorly controlled asthmatics, um, horrible heart disease, things that could be prevented if you had the time to spend with a patient, the time to do more personalized medicine and look for the root cause of many of the things going on with them. Now let's talk about this transition because your father, tell the story about your father. I think first double lung heart transplant, was that it? Yeah, yeah. so my, my father started the, uh, the first transplants here in Colorado, primarily the uh, lung transplantation program. And uh, they had already done a heart transplant here, but he did the first lungs and then also did the first uh, heart double lung, which is basically like dropping in the, the new V8 <laughs> yeah, engine, right. you know, so uh, it was pretty crazy. And, and the funny thing is, you know, my father always wanted me to be a, a heart surgeon, but every dinner time conversation was about, hey, you know, I took care of this, you know, 55-year-old male that uh, was 300 pounds and, um, you know, had a horrible diet, was a smoker, um, uh, had type 2 diabetes, and, and I kept saying to myself, my God, he, you know, if somebody provided good primary care for this individual and and good prevention, they wouldn't be on the operating table getting their chest cracked, getting a quadruple bypass, yeah. and spending millions if not billions of dollars of uh, our money and um, you know, contributing to um, you know, further uh, overusage of the system. So mm -hmm. um, I realized that my calling was to do something more upfront rather yeah. than downstream. I like yeah. that, upfront yeah. rather than downstream, that's great. I guess we can talk a little bit about hormones, but I, lately you've been fired up on the brain. So what, yeah. Talk to us about the study, maybe just an overview of brain health and kind of what you're seeing in conditions that you're improving. Yeah, I think, you know, my interest in brain health has, has come from almost 20 years of practice and seeing just huge amounts of depression, anxiety, uh, the rising rates of ADD, as everybody knows, um, the psychotic episodes of shootings around the country, uh, and then the rise of big pharma finding that there's a designer drug for you. Uh, you know, Celexis, Cymbalta, Paxil, Prozac, um, there's a Me Too drug, Abilify, you know, instead of looking at how can we fix our brains again from the functional root basis rather than there's a designer drug that's going to marginally improve you and may screw you up, um, then I think we can do a lot more for the individual. So I realize that there's a mental health crisis, that there's a rise in mild cognitive impairment, there's a huge rise in Alzheimer's disease, huge rise in traumatic brain injury, or we're recognizing traumatic brain injury much more, and that many of the therapies that are out there are all based at, about making profit from big drugs rather than looking at things in a comprehensive, holistic manner. Sure. Um, so I got frustrated with that. I realized that, okay, what can I do beyond Prozac? And, <laughs> and I said, oh, well, there's neurofeedback, which is a brain training therapy. I bought the device. and realized I didn't have enough time, so I brought on um, a colleague who's now doing neurofeedback in my office. Um, I realized that by training the brain while analyzing brainwave activity that we can improve focus and treat depression oftentimes. Um, I also um, decided that hormone balancing could be utilized to help improve cognitive function. Uh, also, as all of you probably know, nutrition can help hugely in terms of Really? Improving brain function. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, and then last but not least, mindfulness and just good old uh, meditation. And, and it doesn't have to be uh, getting in a lotus position doing transcendental meditation. It can be any type of mindful-based practice that fits your spiritual path 
And it can be as simple as walking in the woods or it can be going to a yoga studio and doing kundalini meditation um, or it can be going to an ashram in India and, and working uh, for months out there uh, trying to get yourself in a balanced state. So I think there's a path for everyone in the mindfulness journey and there's a personalized path for everybody in terms of the nutritional requirements they may need and the hormone balancing they may need based upon the age that they are and, and other stressors that are present. Mm -hmm. One thing I've found is that a lot of guys and gals are tanking on their hormones much earlier than they should be and um, there's a few hypotheses that are out there and some of it is the cortisol that uh, can inhibit some of the pituitary signaling hormones, FSH and LH, and lower our testosterone. Same thing can happen with women, and then we get the adrenal fatigue, we even get drops in growth hormone, et cetera. So trying to address it again by improving their exercise, their mindfulness, and nutrition is, is the, the way we want to go, but if needed, then we can oftentimes add in bioidentical hormone replacement to get them into the, the zone. Mm. Um, so again, I, I think it's all about the, the big picture in terms of brain health, in terms of overall uh, wellness, and if we try to find a silver bullet, uh, we're gonna miss the, yeah. the big opportunity. Sure. And um, yeah, it's been a, been a great journey That's trying amazing. to figure that out. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's kind of explore some of these topics in a little bit more depth. If you could describe neurofeedback and kind of what that really is. I've actually been a you know, client patient slash of yours and experienced that myself and really yeah. noticed improvements in focus and cognition and so forth. Mm -hmm. But how would you describe that to a new patient that may be depressed or have anxiety or you know, uh, focus issues? Yeah, yeah, great question. So what we do is we start with a brain map where we put a cap on your head and uh, we look at the brainwave activity across the various lobes, frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital. We look at um, how the balance is from left to right brain, front to back. Um, we look at whether or not you have a predominance of a particular wave pattern that may be um, indicative of anxiety or depression or attention issues. And we compare that to a computerized normal value um, and then based upon what we see in the computerized read as well as our own clinical read, we're able to train the brain using um, the various leads that will attach to uh, you know, frontal lobe, for example, and monitor your uh, beta wave status, for example, and, and try to calm that down to reduce anxiety. If I want to get you meditating like a Buddhist monk, I'll try to bring you into a high theta state. And the way we do it is through a process called operant conditioning where we um, basically give you a carrot, which is you're watching a movie and the movie plays when you're in the right zone and then it stops when you're not in the right zone or the music can stop and start based upon whether or not you're, you're hitting the right brainwave activity. And then there's other cool things you can do, like we can have you fly a, a helicopter through a canyon uh, with your brain waves and, and do things of that sort that are a little bit more intense mm -hmm. to get you in the zone. So that's been a, a great adjunct to uh, brain health here. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, we would watch, this was several years ago when I lived in Colorado, we would watch 24. Or uh -huh. I would watch, Lori would have me watch 24 and it was really cool because you know, it really trains you quick because you want to watch the movie because it's very exciting, but then if you're not focusing in, in or achieving this brainwave state, then the movie would pause and stop and it's frustrating. So um, <laughs> it's that real-time feedback. Now, for someone that, that is experiencing in your uh, clinical practice uh, anxiety, depression, things of that sort, how many treatments would they need to go on this neurofeedback before they really start to know some nice improvements? I would say most patients can get improvement within 15 to 20 sessions, but a lot of it depends on how well they're able to follow the program and, and focus in on, on the protocol. And some may take 40, some may take 50, but uh, I'd say the average probably around 20 sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, We're um, using some home devices now. There's one called the, the Muse, M-U-S-E, which can do some very basic level type neurofeedback. So some patients will use that at home. Uh, we've got uh, another device by Brain Masters uh, that can be helpful for training the brain. And then there's, of course, um, the heart math programs uh, that are great. Now, they're not looking at brainwave activity. They're looking more at the heart rate variability. And uh, that can be great just to get people doing breath work and meditating and making sure that they're getting into that 
relaxed zone. And, and when the heart rate variability improves, then theta uh, brainwave activity is being enhanced as well. I see. Okay. Um, so that's a nice way to continue the work at home. At home. That's yeah. what I do at home, heart math. Yeah. I've had good feedback with that. Amazing program. And it's great because you can do it with an iPhone or mm -hmm. um, tablet, whichever you prefer. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very cool. That's neat. Now, what about someone that maybe have had a concussion or sports-related injury? Uh, what are some you know protocols that you would suggest for them, maybe yeah. nutritionally, hormonally, and also neurofeedback? Yeah, great question. And that's such a changing um, you know protocol that's out there right now. But we're taking a much more um, proactive approach rather than saying go home and take a nap for a week and come back to play. We're actually trying to do um, brain maps uh, to see where they're at in terms of whether or not there's some dysfunction related to the head injury. Um, I will do SPECT imaging on people that have had a pretty major injury and if they can get it covered by insurance or they can pay out of pocket for it, the SPECT image is the image that looks at um, microvascular blood flow to the cortex of the brain and uses a radionucleotide tracer. Same thing we use when we look at the um, heart when we're doing a, a nuclear scan of the heart. Exact same technology, but we're looking at the brain. Mm -hmm. The SPECT will display areas, for example, if uh, somebody whacked you with a baseball bat to the left temporal region, you would see an area of decreased blood flow here. Um, we could document it via that microvascular blood flow impairment rather than just saying, hey, your MRI looks normal, which anatomically may look absolutely fine, but we're not seeing the small vessel damage that's mm. present. So a lot of times neurologists and ER docs are, are missing the, the more subtle damage to the brain because they're not doing a SPECT image. Um, and other options, we can do PET imaging, which will show this as well. Um, so I'll, I'll do some advanced imaging. Um, I will look that over. I will look at their symptomology, obviously, and if they're far enough out, typically we want to wait at least a month, if not even longer, before we consider this. But in a protocol that I'm doing with the Tug McGraw Foundation uh, and Sarascan imaging, we're using near-infrared light therapy, so we have these little LED lights in a cap that we put over the head, the LEDs emit a wavelength which will go through the skull, mm. um, hit the small vessels in the brain, release some um, NOS, nitric oxide synthetase, cause a vasodilatation, and help to um, reopen many of those capillaries that have been damaged or wow. kind of spasmed. And we've been able to demonstrate this remarkably by repeating the SPECT image after about 18 sessions uh, with the light therapy for 20 minutes and have wow. just seen, I mean, up to 100% improvement in terms of the, the blood flow. That's amazing. And, yeah, it's amazing stuff. So the, the study we're, we just finished was um, on about 15 veterans. Um, most of them were Iraqi veterans, some were from Afghanistan. Many of them had uh, head injuries, but they did not have bleeds in their head related mm. to IED explosions. And some were you know, a year or two years out so they still had the injury, yeah. and even this far out, we were able to remarkably improve their blood flow to their brain. Mm. And by doing that, we also reduced their PTSD, their uh, depression, their anxiety. So, you know, this guy in American Sniper, uh, you know, maybe if he would have been doing something like this sure. rather than being put on ten crazy different medications, which may have completely changed his personality and actually given him psychosis, yeah. Uh, then yeah, we might have a a life. <laughs> Uh, veteran rather than uh, yeah. he and his buddy that were taken out. So I think we're doing the public a, a big disservice by over medicating and not trying to address the blood flow issue, mm -hmm. not trying to address the hormone imbalances, which by the way, when you had a head injury, you can have a major drop in um, testosterone in guys because the pituitary gland, which is dangling at the base of the brain, mm -hmm. gets a huge hit from the coup, counter coup, going back and forth with the small vessels there. Yeah. And that can drop your testosterone in half. And then part of the picture can also be the hormone imbalance, which is part of steroidogenesis, is regenerative to the brain, mm -hmm. helps with the neurotransmitter balance. If they're not looking at that at the VA hospital, in addition to the blood flow, then they're completely missing the boat. Sure. Um, so I hate to be so harsh on <laughs> drug companies, but right. but it's the reality of what I've seen and, and one of the reasons I'm passionate about trying to do therapies outside of the box that will really address the, wow. the root problem. So That's fascinating. So we're excited. We're going to publish a study here um, from this uh, 
uh, 15 individuals that we did, probably in the next two months, we're going to meet and crunch our data. Everything looks very uh, impressive and cool. hopefully go for big dollars uh, with um, DOD funding for 100 or more wow. patients in the future. That's so amazing. Cross our fingers. That's okay. Congrats on that. That's yeah. great, Fred. Now, to back up, what I heard you say right there is even though these veterans had been you know, injured two years past, there was still... You know, if I hit my foot or my leg or something on a table, right, two years later, there's going to be no sign of it. But in the brain, there's significant sign and in inflammation still two years later. Is that what we're talking about? There is. About? Yeah, big time. And, and you look at a lot of these uh, professional football players, for example, many of them, like Tony Dorsett, are years and years out. And uh, they've got this uh, traumatic encephalopathy that's now occurring. So not only do they have the damage that probably could have been documented early on or five years later or whatnot, but they've had chronic inflammation is a result of the, the trauma there. They've not had the good blood flow to be able to repair some of the damage. And as a result, they've started to develop Alzheimer's like symptoms, dementia, and a downward spiral. And the problem is, in people like Tony, is it too late? Probably so in his case, but it'd be worth the trial to get him in. It's not going to hurt him sure. to see if we could turn him around. But my guess is he's, he's probably got more traditional things going on. Um, yeah. but, but hopefully he's got a functional or integrative medicine doc that is looking beyond a pill to treat him. Right. So Interesting. Yeah, yeah a past guest on the show, Tatis Grazi, and he talks about the microglia, the macrophages of the brain, and how they don't turn off. So yeah. an inflammatory event, it literally, he, according to his research, and he just published a couple of papers, I think, on this, um, these microglia just keep going and going and lighting up the inflammatory pathways. And so Exactly, yeah. yeah so... So I think, yeah, until you can turn it off, um, some of that can be done nutritionally, as we know, through curcumin and NRF2 activation and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, anti-inflammatories, omega-3s, medium chain triglycerides, coconut oil, um, you know, good, healthy uh, diet that has plenty of antioxidants, of course, um, and then, of course, keeping your glucose in control mm -hmm. without having metabolic or uh, diabetes, uh, then you're going to be able to make progress. But if you've got a football player that weighs... 300 pounds has been eating crap, uh, has got diabetes or an elevated hemoglobin A1C, they're not exercising anymore, and um, they're not doing any of these antioxidant type therapies. And I, I think, yeah, it's a, a bad, bad situation to be in. And um, if somebody is, you know, willing to, you know, pass on the ball and show them how to run with it again, I think you can recover. But otherwise, yeah, it's, it's, a nursing home right. <laughs> opportunity waiting to happen and uh, <laughs> the memory care unit <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> awaiting his arrival. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that, uh, you know, the, the brave new world of cognitive uh, enhancement or uh, cognitive repair is going to be there, but the, the whole solution is looking at multiple modalities mm -hmm. and trying to hit it from every angle. There's that recent article in Aging Madison, Aging um, magazine by um, uh, Dr. Breedison from uh, California, I believe UCLA, who mm -hmm. talked about, for example, with Alzheimer's, there's 36 different processes they've identified that are related to Alzheimer's disease. Wow. When you look at a medication like Namenda or Aricept, it only addresses one of the 36. But if you apply principles as he did in terms of balancing hormones, nutrition, lifestyle, mindfulness, exercise, that he's actually able to turn these people around and not just get a, a very marginal improvement is is noted typically by the family, if any improvement at all. So I'm, I'm really happy to see him, you know, being bold and realizing that I'm not going to be one of these docs that's just going to talk about single intervention <laughs> therapy. I'm going right. to the global approach. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, which is cool. And when it gets, go back to my travels around the world, one of the things I learned in my travels around the world was... Um, I worked and volunteered in, in Nepal outside of Kathmandu, and I, I worked with um, Tibetan shamans that were up there, uh, traditional Chinese medicine um, practitioners in a rural village north of Kathmandu. Anyhow, the long story short is they realized that with Chinese medicine that you can't just give them one herb, but it was okay. 10, 20 different herbs. They were analyzing qi and you know tongue pulse diagnosis and uh, applying acupuncture and other Tibetan herbs, and then by blending all those things together and, and probably some elements of energy medicine, they were able to, to heal the individual, hmm. but they would never say 
just take ginseng, you're going to be fine. <laughs> right. You know? right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Which is common what we do even in the nutrition industry. People just take glutathione or just take 5-MTHF or whatever. But yeah. like you said, there's, there's many pieces to the puzzle. Yeah, you have to dial that in. And yeah, the MTHF, MTHFR puzzle, um, absolutely, I think that needs to be checked in every individual and addressed um, because that can create some inflammation and neurotransmitter imbalances uh, that can, uh, if corrected, can make a, a big difference in terms of how they heal their brain too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's dive into the energy medicine. Yeah. You know, I know that's something that you really get into with a lot of your patients. Yeah. And I guess that stems from, or how you got onto this was from your travels. You want to, you kind of introduced the topic, but let's talk. You've been diving into this more and more lately. I know, <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, I have a real fascination with energy medicine. And, and part of it is, um, uh, I, I think from my travels, uh, I connect deeply through nature and I, I feel recharged when I'm out hiking and, and being in the, the wilderness and whatnot. And after being in the wilderness, sometimes I'll sit down and, and just meditate and, and relax. It's been, you know, my therapist for, for decades. And luckily I started at a young age and my parents got me into scouting, you know, I was camping out every month, you know, since the age of, of 10. So I realized how nature can really heal the spirit and the mind. Um, but then I also realized that we can go much deeper through elements of acupuncture and deeper uh, means of meditation. And I, I worked with an acupuncturist here in Denver for three years and, and learned a lot about how it can really help balance your meridians and um, balance chi as, as we know it. Uh, even did some qigong classes and um, got into that quite a bit. But I think the the key that I've learned is that energy medicine should just like hormone balancing and nutrition, be a daily part of everybody's life. Mm -hmm. And that energy medicine can be as simple as meditating and, and bring, in, bring in the light uh, to areas of your body that feel out of balance. Or it could be um, more significant, such as working with an acupuncturist or a um, healing hands practitioner or a Reiki master, um, any type of energy medicine that tends to shift you and balance you, I, I think it's worthwhile trying. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to be what I call spiritual adventurers <laughs> to, okay. to see what resonates with your body, because I, I think there's some amazing things that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, like Dr. Uh, David Perlmutter, I have uh, traveled to Peru and worked with shamans in Peru and, and even gone further to actually apprentice uh, with a, a shaman here in the States and, and learn much about Peruvian shamanism and, mm. and ways to integrate that into energy medicine. So um, I think there's a, a lot to be explored there. Yeah. <laughs> so describe that. What is, I'm not familiar with shamanism and I don't think a lot of our listeners are. So you want yeah. to introduce Yeah, that? shamanism is prevalent throughout the world. Mm. Um, probably the root of shamanism is um, from Tibet, actually, um, back in the days of Genghis Khan. Um, but shamans are present with uh, Hopi Indian tribes, with the Navajo. Uh, so Native Americans all have shamans. You can also just call them the, the medicine man. Okay. Uh, the South Americans all have their shamans as well. Um, we had, um, you know, even some of the uh, disciples of Christ were thought to be shamans because they would go into some of these states and be able to energetically connect and mm. receive information that may be healing to others or, or to themselves. Um, but these individuals, shamans, if, if you want to call them that, um, are able to go beyond the realm of our existing world and, and tap into, um, you know, what I would call universal consciousness, um, what Einstein would call universal consciousness, uh, probably what Stephen Hawking and other uh, astrophysicists would agree exists. And, and I think that... Um, Shamans have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years, maybe millions, and they may use plants to get themselves into that state. Mm -hmm. um, such as in Peru, they can use ayahuasca. Uh, the Native Americans may use peyote. Um, there's iboga in Africa. There's various plants that can help activate parts of the brain, particularly uh, the pineal gland mm -hmm. of the brain, which is affiliated with the third eye. And by activating the pineal gland, you're able to activate a deep brain structure that allows you to see um, and receive information from the environment that 
enables you to have um, information regarding healing, uh, information regarding uh, perhaps the leadership of a tribe and uh, things of that sort. For example, how did uh, the Amazonians realize that if they took a frog off a tree in a rainforest and they rubbed it on its back, uh, that it would have you know a curare-like effect and be able to take a monkey out of a tree. Right. And then how did they figure out that if they combined these two random vines in the rainforest, that they would create this unusual activating um, element um, called DMT to the pineal gland to mm -hmm. allow them to go into this um, state of um, kind of out-of-body experience and, and get this information. So I think that's a fascinating area for many mm -hmm. people that uh, anthropologists and there's a physician from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, who's been uh, studying this quite extensively that can be utilized and oftentimes um, uh, helpful in terms of clinical decision making. Mm. So would you say that, uh, you know, by working with shamans and so forth, that people can become more intuitive or do they just, you know, are these for people that kind of reach middle age and wonder what the purpose of their life is? Like mm -hmm. who would really benefit, I guess? From yeah, this? That, that's an excellent question. Um, I think for me personally, uh, it's been medical intuition mm. um, because I, I've realized that I can do so much with a, a lab test. I can do so much with an exam and imaging and whatnot. But if I can sit there and get into the um, uh, deeper elements of a person's health and kind of mm -hmm. tap in through uh, their third eye and be able to appreciate some of the imbalances that may be present in the, the chakras and even mm -hmm. use my hands um, over the top of a body to, to feel imbalances, that I can be much more sensitive and specific in terms of my mm -hmm. diagnosis by adding that on as an element in addition to the usual modern medicine sure. things that are out there. Now, do I tell my patients I'm doing this? <laughs> no. Right. Unless they're open to it, of course. Right. Um, so, you know, today I, I was examining a gal that had uh, some chronic GI problems and, um, you know, she had no idea, you know, after I was checking her liver and spleen and, and whatnot that I was running my hand, feeling her, her chakras just a couple inches above her body. Um, and sometimes uh, people that are, um, interested in energy medicine and definitely know what's going on. They can feel the energy flow as I'm, I'm working with them. But, but other times if it's a, a lawyer who's never had an interest in it, they, they're completely, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, unbeknownst to them uh, that I'm, I'm exploring that form. So I think it's been a, a fun area to explore, not only fun, but um, very useful and interesting. And it gives that much more, depth to my practice as a mm -hmm. clinician and I feel much more rewarded by being able to spend that personalized time with the individual and being able to um, analyze them on a um, chakra based level in addition to the traditional level. So yeah. um, one of the things I've gotten into shamanically has been realizing that sound is a, a huge healer and we know that um, we've stepped away from sound a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> except for a rock and roll. Right. But if you think about primal uh, tribes that are living um, completely isolated from other um, modern society, they're still getting in circle and drumming and chanting and singing. Um, and I think that it can kind of primally, um, uh, sonically entrance the brain to activate deeper brain structures and allow them to... Um, you know, download some of this information and then also to heal themselves energetically because sound, if it's at the right tone, has its own sacred geometry, which is, is very healing as well. So mm -hmm. one of the things I've brought into the practice is uh, we have a sound healing table that has these um, transducers, as I call them, they're not really speakers, they're more toroidal shaped and they send music through the body. It can be as simple as a didgeridoo or a cello or it can be something a little bit more complex. It might be a chanted Sanskrit mantra um, by Deva Pramal or, or a similar artist. And then they're getting the, the vibrational energy that balances the chakras head to toe, as well as the energy of the mantra, mm. uh, whether you're listening to Om Mani Padi Om, which is a mantra of compassion, or Om Benza Sata Om, which is a mantra of purification, mm. all these things 
which have been developed by gurus over you know 50 years of sitting and meditating now are available and can be sonically saturated into your body and and your body your energy body absorbs it your mind absorbs it to a certain degree but it's more your energy body that's going wow something is happening here so you hop off the table and you're like whoa that was deeper than (laughs) any massage i've ever had or any reiki treatment and and what we'll do is we'll do sound therapy during a massage or sound therapy during acupuncture in my office um, or sound therapy while i'm working on somebody who just wants me to do some energy work on them. So it's, it's just amazingly. Wow. Uh, so many tools. Success. So many tools. And, and it just, you know, it really saddens me to think that there's so many great doctors out there that are not interested in this or have not been exposed to it. And, and I think, you know, it takes an individual that has a high level of curiosity and an individual that's willing to go out and spend extra time yeah. beyond going to the traditional medical meeting at the American Academy of Family Medicine, but right. going to, you know, the Energy Medicine Conference for Functional Medicine or going to Peru or, you know, going um, to uh, other sacred areas uh, around the world that I think can be um, very activating uh, from a spiritual and energetic sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to um, explore your dreams and um, explore sacred sites. Um, if I were to give you uh, one sacred site in North America would be Chaco Canyon mm. in New Mexico, just south of Farmington. There's mm. some deep things going on there. It's a great place to meditate. Um, the other really amazing place is uh, Palenque, which is in uh, Mexico. It's a Maya ruin that has amazing energy, too. So I think if you can go to some of these places, have an open mind, and just sit and be with the spirits that are there and the energy that. Uh, has been created and, and continues to be present that uh, it can change in a, in a way that you can't imagine. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. <laughs> Fantastic Fred, uh, information there, Fred. So there's two questions that we ask every guest on the show. And the, the first question would be, if there was just one herb, nutrient, or botanical that you just could not live without and you frequently recommend to your clients and patients, what would that be? Ooh, that's a tough call. Um, I would put CoQ10 up there pretty high because mm-hmm. I, I think that the... Uh, Mitochondrial benefits are, are pretty huge with that. Um, my number two might be um, glutathione or, or NAC. Mm-hmm. And then I think the anti inflammatory benefits of omega 3s and, and krill are pretty huge. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it's tough. And I would say everybody's different. So I'll have 10 people walk in the door and I, say, I may say, you know, based upon your symptoms, CoQ is for you. But based upon your cognitive impairment, I want to go big. I want to go with the, you know, um, some glutathione that's uh, liposomal or, or something that's got a sustained release because we've really got a lot of inflammation in your brain and I want to cool it off. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of it depends sure. on the situation. Perfect. Yeah. Love that detail. Yeah. So uh, last question, if you were to bump shoulders with Barack Obama or, or a, a governor in an elevator <laughs> and they were, you know, asking you as a physician, how could we reduce our healthcare spending? What would you say to them? I would say, <laughs> like through lifestyle, like if through lifestyle, like, I, I would say number one, more mindfulness, mm. absolutely more mindfulness and meditation. I think that's the, the biggest issue. And the number two would be, yeah, being more active and, and exercising more. Cause I, I think the, the two biggest issues are our brains are on fire as it results from all the craziness of the news and being on our iPhones and computers, you, you name it. Uh, and we're overwhelmed and, and fried, um, not to mention all the, the stressors that are around us, whether it's the politics of, of a situation or driving home from, from work, you name it. So if we're able to turn off the brain and be present in the now, um, that's number one. And then number two would be, yeah, let's get off our ass and exercise yeah. every day. And for my patients, if I can even get them off their butts to exercise 15 minutes a day, that's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if I can get them to do 30 minutes to an hour, then wow, I'm really making a a big difference. So I think those two things are the biggest. And I I think that's why we've declined so much. Mm -hmm. um, We're we're seeing more and more gun violence. We're seeing more and more episodes of mental health, more diabetes. And it's all related to uh, a lack of uh, mindfulness and a a lack of exercise. And and part of the, the mindfulness, too, is not just 
meditating, but feeling connected to community. And I think because we're all living in these scattered worlds and our families are in different areas and, and whatnot, that it creates a, a disconnect and we lose that primal sense of, of tribe and, mm-hmm. and belonging. And um, that's where, you know, if you go to a, a rainforest tribe, you're not going to see a lot of mental health issues. Right. I mean, you may see a few, but it's not going to be you know, 30 to 50% of the population like it is here in the States, it seems like these days. Um, but, you know, maybe 5% or something. And I think that's because they've, they've got that community and we've lost that community. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, in a nutshell, that's yeah. where it needs to go. And I think that that would balance out many of the other problems. I wouldn't <laughs> have to do hormones and, right. and all the other advanced <laughs> testing. But we do everything that we can to get people back into a state of wellness and, and then we back off on things as we can if, if things come into greater balance with their mindfulness and exercise. Awesome. Yeah. Fred, thanks so much for being on the program. Yeah, Appreciate yeah that. you're welcome. Great to be here. Yeah. And uh, if you guys ever want to learn about my crazy practice, revolutionarymd.com here in Denver, Colorado. Thanks a lot. Perfect.